<clears throat> presence of everyone and I'm grateful for the technology that we have uh, using Zoom. So I would like to talk tonight about the, uh, the mystery of light. <clears throat> yeah, some of the most common things that we encounter uh, every day are, are a mystery to us. That notwithstanding, we still make good use of them and we don't neglect uh, their effect or utility. Now, I want to ask you something. Do you, do you know what gravity is? Yeah, yeah, I know that you hold up a rock and let it go and it falls to the ground. And of course, you make sure that you're up between the, the rock and the ground. But exactly what is the force we call gravity? I always thought of it as the attraction of uh, two celestial bodies uh, that they have for each other. But there's some thought that it is a space-time continuum, whatever that is, now pushing on mass that forces them together. Well, maybe that's so, but uh, why did it always push them together? Why never apart? <clears throat> that's just one of the mysteries of this uh, great creation of God. Another mystery is that of light. <clears throat> Do you know what light is, really? In the 17th century, a great uh, uh, century of scientific discovery, Sir Isaac Newton, he's uh, possibly the greatest uh, scientist that ever lived, he first postulated that light was made of tiny particles and conducted experiments in which light acted in such a way that was consistent with the way particles would act. Therefore, he proved his case, right? Well, not so much. Another scientist is the Dutchman Christian Huygens postulated that light was not composed of particles at all, but rather consisted of waves. And he conducted experiments that proved it so. <clears throat> light was part of the electromagnetic spectrum that was propagated in waves, something like the waves that um, it, one attained by throwing a pebble in a pond. I might note that electricity and magnetism are two additional conundrums that are put to good use. Don't know what they are exactly, but they're put to good use. So Huygens uh, proved his case, right? Well, not so fast. <clears throat> At the end of the 19th century and on into the 20th, Max Planck, a, a German scientist, did experiments with light and how it reacted with so-called black bodies. <clears throat> it is, of course, uh, too complicated to explain here exactly what the experiment involved, but it indicated that light sometimes acted like particles and sometimes acted like waves. And this is sort of the beginning of quantum mechanics. Albert Einstein and Neil Bohr expanded on this later. So with Newton, we knew that light consisted of particles. Then we didn't. So with Huygens, we knew that light consisted of waves. Then we didn't. Now with Planck, Einstein, and Bohr's, we now know we don't know what light is. But we make good use of it regardless without knowing what it really is. Unlike gravity, sometimes we have light, sometimes we don't. It is uh, proven to be useful to man ever since Adam. <clears throat> so would it be uh, surprising that the Bible has something to say about light and darkness, which is the absence of light? Not at all. <clears throat> it has a lot to say about light. <clears throat> it's mentioned more than 250 times in its physical sense and in its, in its uh, metaphorical sense. Its counterpart, dark or darkness, is mentioned almost as many times. That, if nothing else, indicates that it has some significance to us, and we ought to give it uh, due consideration. I think it'd be a profitable exercise uh, to get a concordance. Uh, if, if you have an electro electronic one like I do, it's much easier to locate. But locate and read all the verses containing these words, and of course, they're cognates. Light can mean a metaphorical burden as used in Matthew 11:30. for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, but 
I am not concerned uh, with that use in this study or nor as used in its purely physical sense. In Ephesians 5, 8, <clears throat> we are told, <clears throat> for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Paul the apostle, the apostle in writing to the Ephesian brethren reminded them that they were once darkness as opposed to light. But now they are light in a particular location, that is, in the Lord. Therefore, he says, you are to walk as children of light. This verse has some important message for me. Therefore, I want to know what is darkness, what is light in the Lord, and how do I walk as children of light? Well, let's deal with darkness as it is, as it is uh, used in the phrase, for you were once darkness. <clears throat> It is notable that Paul expected that the Ephesian brethren could recognize that they had changed from a condition of darkness to one of light, <clears throat> and that they knew what those terms meant in guiding their conduct. In other words, they acknowledged that, uh, that a change in sovereignty had occurred. <clears throat> <clears throat> in New Testament Greek, darkness means metaphorically moral and pure uh, spiritual darkness implying sin through ignorance and or error and the consequences thereof and then metonymically uh, those who are in spiritual darkness one can just imagine that in a condition of total darkness because one is unable to ascertain his environs one can to his or her detriment bump into all sorts of unseen objects. For that reason, old people, <clears throat> uh, I, I think we have some here, old people have night lights in most every room. It's no different with spiritual darkness. That is, that is why Jesus said, he who walks in darkness does not know where he is going, John 12, 35b. Well, we need spiritual light lights. In the Old Testament, darkness is used to depict man's moral depravity, as in Isaiah, the fifth chapter, verse 20. What are those who call evil good and good evil? Who put darkness for light and light for darkness? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? And you know, these people just turn morality on their head, on his head. And it wouldn't be far amiss, generally, describe the current day society in this manner. Darkness also stands for the desolation of divine punishment as in Matthew 25th chapter verse 30 and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> when Paul said in Ephesians 5 8 that there were that they were once in darkness he meant that they were not only in sin, but in that condition of darkness, they were also worthy of punishment. When Paul said in, in his uh, Ephesians 5, 8 verse, that they were once in darkness, but are now light in the Lord, he is saying that they can and should do a comparison and contrast of their current life with their past life. And as a result, they should know the difference that Christ has made in their lives. The antonym to darkness, of course, is uh, light. <clears throat> if Paul says that we are light in the Lord, therefore walk as children of light, then we should know what is meant by the word light and what it means to walk as children of light. In the Old Testament, light often denotes a state of life as opposed to death. The psalmist said in the 56th Psalm, verse 13, for you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living? <clears throat> light uh, portrays the salvation and blessing which God gives to his people. As was said in the 27th Psalm, verse one, the Lord is my light and salvation. Jesus himself said that 
I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 8, verse 12. Paul was sent to the Gentiles to, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me, that is, Jesus, Acts, the 26th verse, the 26th chapter, verse 18. <clears throat> Certainly in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, light symbolizes moral purity. Now you might look at the first John, uh, first chapter, verse five, and first Thessalonians, fifth chapter, verse five. Jesus said that he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God, John 3.21. And of course, that God's word is truth, John 17, verse 17. So it would have been just as correct to say that he who does the word of truth and comes to the light uh, in, in in that uh, verse just uh, mentioned. It's uh, they're saying the same thing. In the Hebrew epistle, in chapters 6, verses 4 through 6, it speaks of the enlightened ones, <clears throat> the ones who have come to the light and were provisionally saved. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 32, which we may get to not get to tonight, may not, the writer tells uh, the wavering Hebrew Christians that in the former days, after they were illuminated, they endured a great struggle. <clears throat> the light that enlightened and illuminated them was the gospel of Christ, the word of truth, God's power to save, Romans 1.16. <clears throat> the responsibility laid upon us is to walk in the light. That, that's command. Walking is commonly used as a figure of speech for Christian conduct according to the standard of truth, the gospel, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It says in 2 Corinthians 5th chapter verse 7 that we walk by faith and not by sight. <clears throat> Paul the writer could just as have actually said that we should walk by the faith which is once for all delivered to the saints, G3. The gospel of Christ, God's power to save, Romans 116. Walking in, indicates forward emotion, not stasis or backsliding. The Christian is always pressing onward. As Paul said in Philippians, the third chapter, verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. <clears throat> Pressing onward indicates that there is a certain destination to attain and a predetermined road to get there. Our only option is to follow that predetermined road, not to create it. <clears throat> it is not within us to direct our own footsteps. Jeremiah the 10th chapter verse 23. <clears throat> Walking or pressing onward means to advance in an orderly fashion as opposed to just gathering about. It is said in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 15, that if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. The spirits, by the words of the gospel, his spiritual sword, Ephesians 6, 17, indicates the pathway we should follow. It directs our footsteps. If then the Christian is directed along the pathway to everlasting life, one would naturally assume that the rules in other matters determine acceptable obedience, Colossians 3, 17, would be recognized as being the same for everyone. <clears throat> After all, we cannot direct our own footsteps, but that's not the case at all. We know that. It uh, must be then that uh, most are directing their own footsteps and therefore are walking in darkness and not in the light. Fruitfulness is what the Lord desires from our walk in him is set forth in the parables of the wicked vine dressers, soils and talents. Only by walking in the light of God's word do we have the possibility of producing the fruit of the spirit, the singular fruit of the spirit. 
The only faithful Christians are the ground that is the soil, which uh, brings forth fruit. Paul continued his exhortation in Ephesians 5, 8 by writing in, in uh, Ephesians 5, verse 9 through 17. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, that's uh, benevolence or active good. Righteousness, that's conformity in the divine will and word, thought and action. And truth, that's the reality of spiritual facts as opposed to the lie. You know, thy word is truth. It says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Of course, he mentions additional fruit in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, that's unfelt, and selfishly meeting the needs of others. Joy, that's rejoicing no matter what the circumstances. Uh, a peace, that's tranquility in spite of the opposing for forces experienced in the world. Long suffering, patience towards people, but not tolerance of sin. Kindness, that's a kind disposition and goodness, now that's being righteous in indignation, such as when uh, Jesus drove out the uh, uh, money changers, he was good, but he was indignant also. In faithfulness, that's trusting God, whatever the circumstances. Gentleness, I think in the King James says meekness, that's a gentleness with power, is not weakness. In self-control, that's temperance, against such there is no law. We awake from sleep, that is uh, darkness, when we walk in the light. <clears throat> Christ gives us that light. Walking the light means that we must constantly test ourselves. From the Ephesian passage we just read, it is finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. The word finding or proving, in, in a, as used by the King James Version in ASV, uh, finding used in verse 10 is the same Greek word used in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 10, translated test or prove. Therefore, if we use the King James Version, the prove all things, hold fast that which is good, of 1 Thessalonians 5.21, is the same as proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, Ephesians 5.10. <clears throat> the Greek word translated prove means testing, uh, putting something to trial, to judge whether it is fit, proper. Well, I'll start back up uh, after the uh, Galatian passage. We are awake from sleep, that is darkness, when we walk in the light. Christ gives us that light. Walking in the light means that we must constantly test ourselves. From the Ephesian passage we just read, it is finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. The word finding, proving, as used in the King James Version and the ASV, is the same Greek word used in Thessalonians 5, verse 10, translated test or prove. Therefore, if you use the wording in the King James Version, they prove all things, hold fast that which is good of uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 is the same as the proving what is acceptable unto the Lord of Ephesians 5 verse 10. The Greek word translated prove means testing, putting something to trial to judge whether it is fit, proper, and supported by scripture. In Ephesians 5.17, uh, says that we are not to be unwise, but are to understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand uh, is used there as a similar meaning to prove. It means the comprehending activity of the mind, which entails the assembling of individual facts 
into an organized whole. The mind that grasps the concepts and sees the proper relationship between them. Such understanding includes the moral and religious awareness of man's heart. It is possible and must be guarded against to act without the wisdom that is from above James 317 that is a proper spiritual discretion. Christ also warned us against giving what is holy to the dogs, uh, nor casting your pearls before swine, Matthew 7, verse 6. Our unwavering standard, therefore, must be what is acceptable to the Lord, Ephesians 5, 10. Of course, that which is unacceptable to the Lord, we are instructed to have no fellowship with, uh, but rather expose them, Ephesians 5, verse 11. In this pernicious society, it is evident that the children of darkness sometimes have works more vigorous and persistent than the children of light. But the end of their works will be death, Romans 6, verse 21. Paul lists the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, and says that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Eternal darkness shall be their inheritance. <clears throat> Similar deeds of darkness are listed in Galatians, the third chapter, verses five through nine. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is adultery. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedient, in which you yourselves once walked, when you lived in them. But now you, selves, you, you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. A Christian cannot participate in any, any of these things without adversely affecting the light that he is to display. The very nature of a faithful Christian as light will expose and judge the works of darkness. As is said in Ephesians 5.13, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. <clears throat> we deny the eternal hope that is ours in Christ if we participate in the useless and temporary works of the flesh or have fellowship with those who do. We are to be imitators of God as dear, dear children, Ephesians 5, verse 1. In conclusion, if we walk as children of light only, then, uh, then may we dwell in it. And uh, as it says in the Revelations 21, verses 23 through 27, we may dwell in the city that has no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall be by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. That's those of darkness, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Again, I appreciate your kind uh, attention to these a few words. Hope they've been very useful. Thank you.